All right, everybody, we are live for episode 30 of Practical Chrome. This is, of course, uh, ARM versus x86. What is in your Chromebook? Of course, this episode is brought to you by the Effective Group. Do you need a fantastic website that not only looks great on mobiles and tablets, but also gets you selling online? Then the Effective Group is the company for you. Find out more about the Effective Group, view their profile, uh, portfolio, and read about their successes, visit effective-group.com. And again, we thank them for sponsoring the show. Um, of course, I'd like to, to welcome my, my, my co-hosts, Mr. Welvis, Mr. Tomlinson. Mr. Tomlinson, how are you doing this week? I'm doing great, John. How about you? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And Mr. Mr. Welvis. Hey. Hey, there you go. So... So guys, we are we are we are primed up for episode thirty of Practical Chrome. Now everyone, Practical Chrome is the show dedicated to everything Chrome, right? Um, and and on this week's show, we're going to look at the difference between ARM and x86 processors, uh, with more models coming out containing both chips. Which both, containing both chips, which one should you choose? Is the is there one better than the other? Uh, we're going to answer those questions and look at the future of the chips on this episode. Also, the news OS competitor for Chrome OS, a Chrome OS competitor, there you go, um, is vying for the sub-250 laptop market come this Christmas, and there also appears to be more handwriting on the wall that Chrome OS is getting touch-friendly. So that's what's coming up on this episode. And guys, if you if you missed this show or you, you don't watch it live and, or you want to uh, catch it online, definitely check out practicalchrome.com. That's where we have all of everything posted, the, the YouTube videos, the MP3s come out uh, in a few days usually, um, but this is where you're going to come for the tips and reviews and news all about Google Chrome, the browser, the OS, uh, Chromecast. I finally got mine working again, although that's a long story. Um, so we've been using that. Like my daughters have been watching some uh, some Google Play stuff, so they're very excited. Um, but this this podcast is uh, and videocast is all about things that are Google Chrome related. So again, welcome everybody who's watching. Um, this is actually going to be our first episode, also where I had turned on the chat feature in the uh, Hangout on Air. So if you're watching the Hangout on Air and you're live with us, you can actually post a question live. Um, so that way, when we get to the kind of the I guess the Q and A section. Do we have a Q and A section, gentlemen? I don't think we do. <laughs> so, um, but we'll try our best to. Um, to bring them in if I if I see one come up uh, coming up here. So again, welcome everybody, Craig James. What I want to do is um, explain the TV. My TV changed, and this is kind of a PSA announcement. I have two PSAs this week. It's the deuce on PSAs. One surge protectors. They are literally the best insurance that you can buy when it comes to your electronics. <laughs> Last evening, I was on my way home. Um, everything is hunky dory. I get home and my wife's like, "There's been a lightning strike and some things aren't working." Uh, one being the television, the other being the cable box seems to be doing some kind of weird dance in the lights, and uh, there's no internet. <laughs> so, um, what happened was is that the uh, when I say surge protectors, I mean the good ones, the ones with Ethernet and coax, all that good stuff, because our our awesome lightning bolt went through the coaxial cable from the cable company. Right into my cable modem. Boop. Dead. Uh, it then also went through the coaxial cable to my cable box. Boop. Dead. But that also sent it to the sister board of the TV that you see behind me, which holds nothing but HDMI ports, and all the ports are dead. The port for um, computers is fine, and so is the component one. Uh, but our DVD player and most of other stuff is all HDMI, so basically we're, we're out of big... TV upstairs, and I'm our little guy that was behind me is now up there, which saddens us greatly when we go to watch television, because this beauty right here was there, and now it's not. And now it's being used for the glory of showing you Chrome every Tuesday at 10.10 on Practical Chrome. So uh, remember, everyone, search protectors. So it's a good thing. Um, it's better than having to buy equipment over and over and over again. Um, the other PSA is, is net neutrality. I'm going to put a link in the show notes. I forgot to get the link. Um, Craig, you're, you're, a, you're a huge fan of the John Oliver because he's got the, uh, the podcast there, The Bugle, which I had never heard before, and you kind of pushed me over there. Great satire podcast, fun to listen to. But he also has a show, right, This Week Today. That's what it's called, I believe. Isn't that what it's called? Is that what it's called, Craig? 
This week tonight. It's Sundays tonight. on HBO. Exactly. Um, it's the show that you go, you turn on HBO and you go, where the is my Game of Thrones? <laughs> I said that the other day. Um, it was pretty funny because we did that. So, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's a great show, and he has a net neutrality thing on there. And I wanted to bring up net neutrality again. We've brought it up before, but it's something that if you can read up about it, I'm going to have the link. To, I'm going to try and find the clip from the John Oliver show because he kind of puts it into perspective. Of course, it's hilarious, but I wanted to um, catalog that link, I thought that, that, that uh, clip from his show because it's very serious. And even in, when he talks on, on The Bugle, he talked about how it's a serious, very serious subject, but yet he makes light of it. Um, so there's that. But well, let's get into some Chrome news. James, are you ready for Chrome news? I'm always ready for Chrome news, John. There you go. Mr. Tomlinson, are you ready for Chrome news? No, absolutely not. No? Let's go. Okay. <laughs> you selfish jerk. Uh, okay, so the things that I want to talk about in regard to news is we did have a slightly um, light news week, but when it comes to... Um, Windows and the competitor. I made that joke about the competitor because I really don't want to call it Microsoft anymore because, you know what? If they're actively attacking Chrome OS in their advertising, they're not attacking, but they're trying to put out marketing material that goes against uh, Chrome OS, they're, they're, we're now officially a, a strong competitor. And, uh, yeah, you know, we see, we see it in the education market, things like that. But the... Uh, the, this, this, this advertisement actually goes into the, the selling the value of Windows, six things a Chromebook can't do. And this, this advertisement is uh, was found by uh, favbrowser.com. And basically it's a small article about the, about the advertisement and about the fact that um, it's another list where they're coming out with, because they're going to be coming out with $250 Windows machines and even less come this uh, Christmas time. Um, and then there's these six... Six things, right? Which I think we've already talked about before, but I just thought it was funny um, that they're they're still doing it, even though. And, and the favorite one, uh, um, James, what's your favorite one on that list there? Oh man, I have to pick a favorite. Yeah. Um. Well, <laughs> the man, that's hard. The first one was was funny because it's just so it's just not true. I mean, it's a hundred percent not true. So that was kind of funny. Um, I don't know if it's, it's pretty clear that Microsoft isn't really uh, paying a whole lot of attention and not enough attention to Chromebooks to actually know what they can and cannot do before they make these ads. Um, so that was kind of funny. They're all, I mean, really the only one on that list that's even actually true is number six. You cannot print directly to a printer. Okay. You can still print with Google Cloud Print, but yeah, there's no... You can't connect a cable from your Chromebook to your printer. Apparently, people still do that. I don't know why, but so that's technically true. All the other ones are just false. I mean, just completely false uh, accusations. I'm right there with you. And the first one you were talking about was um, run both native and web apps um, on Windows, and you can't do it on Chrome. And as we all know, Chrome actually does have Chrome OS does have some native apps. Um, on the machine, as well as you have the native client apps, which means that you're running C code um, on the machine as well. Craig, did you have a did you have a favorite something that uh, made you made you kind of giggle a little bit? Yeah, actually, um, number five is great, and I'll get to that in just a second. But uh, to quickly add on to what James said, number six is actually factually untrue. Uh, there is a, an API called Chrome Serial, uh, Chrome dot Serial. And there is a sample app that lets you print um, mailing labels to a specific printer. And basically, the idea is um, rather than having drivers, you just build an app with the ability to communicate over serial USB with the device directly. Um, so rather than go reaching out to the web, finding these specific drivers, and that works better with some hardware compared to others. Anything that's slightly standardized is going to work better than something that Every piece of hardware is different, but uh, there is an app, a sample app, that lets you print mailing labels. So even that one's not really true. Uh, but number five says work with many accessories, um, i.e. driver availability. And I kind of feel like there is merit to that, um, but only as far as, uh, only a little bit, because drivers aren't actually part of Chrome OS. 
it's act, it, they actually completely violate the ideology of Chrome OS, which is that you shouldn't need drivers because we sh it's 2014. We shouldn't need drivers for hardware anymore. It should just work by now. And if it doesn't, then we need to fix it. We need to fundamentally change how the hardware and software pair together in order to be done with drivers. And we've seen this with things like USB mass storage, flash drives originally required drivers. I remember having a Sony flash drive with, I want to say 64 megabytes of space. It might have been 128 megabytes. Um, but it required a Sony driver to install. And it had the driver built into the hardware. You plug it in. It loaded the driver before it tried to connect. But uh, And then we standardized them. And we said, OK, we need a spec that allows us to have some standards so that we don't need drivers for every little flash drive we have. And we're seeing that now with printers, too, although we're kind of seeing drivers die with printers thanks to cloud print, uh, which, honestly, if you go into a store today and you buy a new Windows laptop and a new printer, you're going to be using cloud print or at least wireless printing anyway. People buying a new printer don't want to have to physically plug it in. So uh, for, as far as a selling point goes, I don't think that's a selling point, or at least not to the average consumer. Enterprise, maybe, but they work with print servers anyway, which can be configured to work with Chrome OS pretty easily with an intermediary device. So uh, it's laughable. It's a laughable list. There's not much else you can say about it. Speaking of that, we did we did get a, I did find a soundboard on a Hangouts on Air. So for this advertising campaign and the, uh, the fact they say things like desktop applications as if Chrome OS is, doesn't have them. <laughs> It's, it's just laughable, right? It's just terrible. So, so that's what I say to that. Um, the those that was my favorite actually. The desktop applications, like, what does that mean? What is what is your you know terminology? Is that it's sitting on the desktop? I, I don't. Are you are you are you making a comment about the fact that we don't have icons on the desktop? I don't I don't quite understand um, how that works. So, so that that was. I mean, maybe it's a slow news week, and I just like, I think James, you said that you're like whoa. Just the news week, um, but yeah, that's pretty cool. So the uh, now next up is the Verge. Microsoft launches a price assault on Chromebooks. So this is kind of kind of had to do with the fact that I was talking about the um, the fact that come uh, winter time, it's got the same advertisement, but coming up down the road, they're looking at um, HP is planning to release a seven and eight inch versions of its new stream PCs for ninety nine dollars. Now, this is actually going to go into later on in the show, in the main section, we're going to talk about um, the ARM chip, we're going to talk about possibly having lower-end, excuse me, lower-end machines um, with the ARM chip in them and possibly being at the $100 level, which, which is a possibility. But this is now Microsoft stating, you know what, we, we're going to go after this market um, and make sure that we can, we can compete with the Chromebook, right? That last article we just talked about, this the six things that they kind of hit on. But this is a, an article from The Verge talking about the fact that they're really Microsoft is really coming as a, being a, now a competitor of Chrome OS and realizing that they're really coming after after you know after Chrome OS and the market share that they're that they're taking away. Craig, I know we kind of just talked about it a minute ago. We know about the six things. We know that they're that we we kind of debunked those, and then and actually in a couple of different episodes of Practical Chrome. But what about the fact that coming up now, manufacturers have the license agreements low enough, the, the hardware specs are going to be low enough that they they state they can run Windows on a ninety nine dollar machine. It's laughable. I'll be honest. Do you um, want to hit the button? I can hit the button. That's going to become. That's going to get older real quick. Um, I love I it. I think. I think the important thing to remember here is that if we're going to decide, if we're going to call this a race to the bottom, if that's what we're going to call it, we're going to say we're aiming for the ninety-nine dollar machine or the forty-nine dollar machine or the ninety-nine cent machine. We need to realize that for Google, this has been a work in progress for years. Uh, if we're racing to the bottom, they dug the hole, they built the elevator and they took the ride down smoothly. This has been a transitional process. They knew what they wanted, and they've been building it. Whereas Microsoft, this is definitely a reaction. This is them prying the elevator doors open and falling down the shaft. Sure, both companies end up at the bottom, 
but only Google's prepared to be there. I don't think that Windows that Microsoft is going to be able to optimize Windows quickly enough to run on lower level hardware the way Google has been able to optimize Chrome OS to run on the same hardware. I just activated my OK Google. Okay. Um, so I, I, I definitely think there's going to be a real difference in the software experience for the user. We've seen what Chromebooks can do on low-end low hardware, and things like the HP 11 Chromebook or the original Samsung Series 3, they were nice machines, but they were a little sluggish, even with Chrome OS. I... I am really scared to see what those things will be like with Windows. I mean, I, the netbook era is probably being a little too forgiving to say what we experience-wise what we may see because we're talking really low-end hardware. Remind me, what's the install size for Windows 8? Because I, I remember someone saying it doesn't actually fit on a 16-gigabyte solid-state drive. So if, they would, if you put like a 64 gigabyte solid state drive in there, again, you're not going to be able to hit that price point. So what kind of hard drives are they putting in these things? If they're spinning, they're not going to boot as quick. I just really think that this is a reaction and that Chrome OS kind of, it was futuristic at the time. Everyone laughed at it because it seemed so far away, but they kind of forgot that technology does move quick. And by Microsoft laughing at it then, now they're trying to play catch up and honestly, I see it going about as well as Windows Phone has because they missed mobile, and they missed mobile big time. Um, I'm kind of afraid for Microsoft's sake because I do like competition that, that may, this may be that. They may have missed this, and I, I just don't know that they'll be able to play catch-up as quickly as Chrome keeps moving forward. I mean, we are talking six-week release cycles versus Microsoft's kind of annual or biannual or once a decade, they force you to stop using their old stuff and get you migrated to the new stuff. So I just don't know that they're going to be able to keep pace, unfortunately. Four, four, 14 years, Craig. 14 years okay. between XP and Sunset. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and the Verge article does a, does a really good job, a write-up about that, especially about the netbook era. They actually state, Microsoft will just have to ensure that its PC partners don't turn this pricing opportunity into a second round of underpowered netbooks. Otherwise, the simplicity and performance of Chrome OS might just tempt holiday shoppers away from Windows. Now, of course, in the in the display, you're going to have a machine that's probably already on, number one. Um, now, there's that, and then there's also something else. Do you guys remember when we talked about possibly a Bing OS? I mean, could this could we be talking about a Bing OS here? I, I, I'm not sure, but James, I'm gonna throw it to you without the Bing OS thing, because that's a whole different subject. We have a whole episode about that. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts on the fact that we're gonna have Windows 7, probably like a starter slash RT edition, right? That we see in the in the um, in the in the old Surface RT model. You know, you've got some ARM thing that can run, on, you know, on Windows that can run on ARM, but you can't install apps on, or maybe you have you know, Intel chips, and you can install stuff on it, but what are your thoughts on the fact that we could be at a 99 at least sub-$200 market on a Windows machine? Uh, I think that's that's a terrible, terrible idea. Um, I feel like we've seen this before with BlackBerry, where they pretty much owned the entire smartphone market for a short time. Microsoft owned the computer market for a long time, but they both owned their markets, and then somebody else came out with something that was just a little more attractive, it worked a little better, um, and then BlackBerry just kind of became the enterprise smartphone. Um, and then they just kind of became the, they don't make cell phones anymore. And I'm kind of almost seeing this in Microsoft's future where they're, um, they owned the market and, and they're, they're very quickly going to become the kind of enterprise only, like, you have a Windows machine because maybe you have to for your enterprise applications for a while, and then um, they're going to try to ride those coattails for a while, and then other options like Chrome or S are going to catch up to enterprise, and they're going to lose that market too. And I'm kind of with Craig. I'm, I'm a little worried about Microsoft's future. Um, I don't think that they're prepared for this. Um, Windows RT is... is <laughs> Chrome OS like in that it's very, that it's like they try to make a watered down version of, of Windows that that maybe would run on lower hardware, but really, the overwhelming, the overwelming, 
consensus seems to be that it's just a poor experience. Whereas Chrome OS, the overwhelming consensus of people who use it is that it's been a great experience. So Microsoft has a lot of work to do if they're going to convince us to use their whatever they call it, if they're just going to keep going with RT or some other kind of OS to work on a $100 machine or whatever they're going to do. They have a lot of work to do to gain our trust back, um, I think, after Windows 8 and after RT being so terrible. Agreed. Now, the other thing that I noticed with this article that, <clears throat> that jumps out at me is a 7 and 8 inch version and they say stream PC. So stream, of course, to me sounds like internet, and then but PC still sounds like a full-blown device, like keyboard. You say PC, you're talking personal computer. So I'm not sure what that exactly means. So we'll have to see what all that that means coming down the road. Um, but I totally agree with you guys. It's you know, someone says uh, you know I'm going to build a, a Windows machine under under ninety nine dollars. It's kind of a you know, just just crickets. <laughs> Just <laughs> the room is silent. The room is <laughs> sorry. I got the, look. The the, the 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 sounds are fun. You guys can pull them up, and you know you could definitely like. I think it's called. Um, what's it called? <laughs> By the way, we of course we are a Google Hangout on air, so of course the Google Effects app is what I'm using there. Um, so <laughs> anyway, the uh, it is it is a. It's going to be an interesting run, especially come Christmas. We're going to see a lot of interesting things. Um, this is just a small article, but the fact that Dell is stopping sales of the Dell 11 Chromebook or Chromebook 11 on their website because of the fact that consumers have really been digging at them, grabbing them, picking them up. So Dell is, stop, is going to stop being a direct supplier of the machine on their Dell.com website. I think this is another indication that, you know, we Chromebooks really have taken off, and this is just another indication of that. Um, don't really have to comment on. I just had a link in the article just because I thought it was an interesting article, but the fact that you know Dell had to stop direct selling because they just and with the education market coming along, it's gotten great reviews as a very sturdy model. Um, Ken Hess, who was on the show once, he's he reviewed it, said it's very sturdy. It's it's a great machine, so that's very interesting that they're that they're having to stop, and that's how that's how you know great. You know, the, the, the machines are selling. So it's good stuff. Good stuff. Now, into kind of like the ARM a little bit. Okay, we're going to jump into the whole ARM versus x86 uh, thing. Uh, article on OMG Chrome uh, titled, Is a Dirt Cheap MediaTek Chromebook on the Way? Now, MediaTek is a semiconductor company. Uh, and we're going to, again, we're going to talk more about ARM, semiconductor companies, uh, the ARM chipset, things like that later on. But, um, you know, this was released by Fran, uh, Francis, Francois before about the fact that in the in the code line they found some commits talking about um, making a new board out of a MediaTek system, right? Out of, a, out of a Core ARM Cortex A7 chip. The thing is, it's an incredibly underpowered ARM chip, so this it gets kind of really interesting uh, in regard to the the ARM chips coming out. So. James, I want to throw it to you first. Before we get into the discussion of ARM chips versus Intel chips, or x86, depending on who you talk to, um, before we get into that, what are your thoughts on the fact that someone might throw in a really underpowered chip, it doesn't matter which one, um, and start making a, a Chromebook that's, that might be pretty, pretty weak at, at that point? Well, um, isn't underpowered ARM a little redundant, John? <laughs> We're not there yet. We're not in that discussion yet, okay? So, um, but, but you know what? Good one. We'll give you that. Yes. Yes, I have a new goal. <laughs> Make you push that button as much as I can. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of... Um, $200 is already just ridiculously cheap, I feel like. And I we talked a little bit about this last week. Uh, there is a... You do have to worry about perception when you're talking about price of something. Um, and it and it sounds like if this is an underpowered ARM device, then when somebody looks at it and says, "Oh wow, that's a hundred dollars. It must be really cheap," they're gonna be right. They're gonna they're gonna use a Chromebook, and it's gonna be really slow. Uh, like Craig mentioned, the the regular ARM chips we have now are a little bit sluggish, but they're not bad. I mean, you get you get what you pay for. We're talking about a very light OS, and the ARM Chromebooks now are just fine for a lot of people. 
But if you put an even slower chip in these things, sell it for a hundred bucks, you're gonna have what I see, what I saw happen with Android a lot of times is, is the OS is great, but these manufacturers are putting it on these terrible phones, and it's giving people a bad taste for the Android operating system because they bought the cheapest phone they could, and they had a terrible experience. I don't want to see that happen to Chrome OS, where people buy a hundred dollar laptop. And they say, "Oh, these are these are just crappy. It's slow. I can't have more than two tabs open at a time." And then they're just gonna. It's gonna take a lot to convince them to give a, a more expensive Chromebook a shot after that. So that, that that's a good point. We we talked about that last week. You know, if you have a if you have a PC, something labeled as a personal computer, not a phone, not a tablet, but a personal computer that has a a either a trackpad or a mouse and a keyboard and a decent sized screen, then you are you are doing personal computing, right? And we all know that the two hundred dollar level seems to be kind of like that nice sweet spot where it's like, okay, I'm still getting something that I can use, especially with Chrome OS and it's it's very innovative forward thinking mentality. Craig, you mentioned this earlier about the fact that they built it from the ground up to be on these some of these lower end systems, but also to be able to you know, modify and get it to run on the system as, as it needs to be, right? So they have images for each system, right? So unlike Windows, where they're trying to they're trying to they're trying to take this large, this huge bag, and they say, "Here's the big bag," and then you can just you know you're only going to use you know 10% of it, and that's what you're going to run on your machine to make it run Windows. But Craig, about that point, here we have possibly because of this underpowered. ARM chipset, and and the the quote here is that under under performance, um, Joy from OMG Chrome says, against the typical Celeron processors found in most Chromebooks, a Cortex A7 processor would deliver incredibly poor performance. It would even struggle against the sluggish Cortex A15 Samsung Exynos chip found in the first generation Samsung and HP 11 Chromebooks. So, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, are, are are they gonna, you know, because Google does get better with the with the performance over time? What are your thoughts? I think we're looking at this the wrong way. We're reading this article, we're understanding the facts, and we're assuming that this would be a consumer model device. It doesn't sound that way to me. If you're talking really, really underpowered, I see a, two immediate possibilities that would make sense. Uh, it could be an embedded system in a kiosk because Chrome OS already has a kiosk mode, and you wouldn't need a lot of power to run that, but you would want it self-contained, and you would probably want it small enough, like Raspberry Pi possibly sized, so that you could stuff the guts into a small, probably just thin tablet size type of display, and just slide that into a custom-built kiosk stand. Uh, the other option would be uh, like kindergarten, um, elementary school kids, uh, just super, super cheap, durable laptops that don't need awesome performance because the kids aren't ready to do a lot with them yet. Um, when you get into high school, the, the more powerful Chromebooks make sense because you're writing papers, you're researching projects, but as kind of elementary school, especially first, second, maybe third grade, when you're using these mostly for classroom use, Maybe not every student gets a laptop, but maybe there's only a couple, or maybe they're the all-in-one uh, Chrome-based type units, and there's just two per classroom. And if you can buy them for $99 or $89 a piece, um, and the kids just use it to check their um, reading points for the week or whatever, um, or even just play a couple very simple games that give them a little bit of interactive learning or the typing tests that kids are doing nowadays. Uh, something like that would make a lot of sense, but I don't see this being uh, workable as a consumer release device. I just, I don't think the chip is powerful enough to perform, uh, like James said, James said it perfectly, it would be a very poor impression um, of Chrome OS, and the price point is not worth the trade-off today, not when Chrome OS is still relatively immature um, and unknown to a lot of mainstream customers. I don't think it's a good idea but I don't work in Google's marketing team either. So, uh, but I do think there are use cases where it makes sense, specifically kiosks or early education. Um, but I don't know that, if I had to take a wild guess, I would say this, it's the only thing that makes sense. I can't see them putting this chip in a model and trying to sell it for $99 on Amazon. I just don't think it would work. 
even in developing nations or something as like a giveaway type thing or a charity type thing where you buy a Chromebook and they give a Chromebook, they're just too underpowered to really be effective. Um, so I, I, not a consumer release. I would bet money that this is not a consumer release. And you know what I can... I, I totally see that. I, t- I totally understand. Because if you do have something like a Raspberry Top a Raspberry Pi size machine, you would want it to boot into like a kiosk mode, have that one app running. Um, I think that's actually a very good idea. And if it was only fifty dollars per classroom, forty dollars per classroom, maybe a hundred dollars per classroom, but um, and then it would just be a headless device that the management ran, right? And then that way, the, the, the teacher could just post the whatever too. That makes a lot of sense. Kiosk mode makes a lot of sense. I can see that. And you know what? Uh, Let's 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 mark that down. Craig said it's going to be uh, uh, you know kind of like a device that's not necessarily for the consumer market. It's going to be something that you know uh, people are going to use in 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 a different vein. So we'll go with that. I'm good. I'm good with that. I like it. So now it's time to, we're going to jump into the main. But before we do that, I do want to of course thank our sponsor, uh, Effective-Group.com. Right. So Effective Group's stats show that they increased the turnover. Uh, their inquiry rates on on a, on a customer's website nearly ninefold, right? And what they do is they they do a number of things uh, in in regard to services for their clients. The effective group, their tagline makes a heck of a lot of sense. The effective group making the internet work for you. So if you own a company or you have a brand that you need to put out there into the inner inner in the interwebs as we call them, um, because that's where people are. Um, when I talk about Practical Chrome. People want to ask me, you know, where does all your traffic come from? How does how do you make that that work for you? What do you what are you seeing? And I'm seeing 80% of people hitting the website with a mobile device. So right, like right there, there's something that some a lot of people don't even see. They don't they forget that people are driving in their cars, they're trying to get to your your location, your store. You should really have a mobile site ready to go. Things like that. What if you want to have a social experience, a social presence out there on Twitter, Facebook, you know, G plus. Um, you know, Pinterest, things like that, and you want to be able to manage that in a, you know, kind of a, a style that you know would would help you in a marketing area. That's what the effective group does. They make the internet work for you. They, they work with you directly to make sure that what you put out online brings the customers to you, if that, if that kind of makes sense. And when you want to put something out on the web, you don't want to just shout out information. They want to be able to make sure that it's not just Material, but it's good material, right? And they work with you on the website design, so that way you, it, it conforms to mobile, but it looks the same on the uh, on the desktop. So if someone is researching at home or at work, it's going to look a certain way. And then when they get in their car and then they're trying to find the place, the website will also have the same look and feel, so they know they're at the right spot. Um, they also work on, on search engine optimization and management, which means that if someone searches for you on any of the major search engines, Yahoo, Google, any of them, you're the first thing that comes up, whether you sell, you know, tea cakes or mittens. They're, they're going to make sure that you're the one that's found in that spot, especially for geolocation purposes, right? So they're going to help you with that. Um, PPC management, which is price per click, product listing ads management, social media, media management, like I said before. They help you with all that. They kind of guide you through that entire process. So you're definitely going to want to check out the effective group. If you head over to www.theeffective or sorry, www.effective-group.com, you'll be able to see some of their success stories, some of their portfolios, and a lot of the websites that they've built for other use, uh, other other clients. And they're really fantastic. If you open them up on a mobile device or on the desktop, you'll see the difference in how there isn't much. It's just been compressed a little bit, but yet it's still completely readable and workable. Um, but they also work with those clients on the, the SEO management search engine as well as the social media. So definitely check them out. Again, that's www.effective-group.com. Been in the business for 15 years, based out of the UK. They can definitely get you selling online. And again, we thank them. Uh, Practical Chrome, we've had them now for, for, for a long time, and we really appreciate having them as a sponsor. They've been, they've been super fantastic. Um, we, we thank them for that. So now it's on to the main. That's right. I have buttons with sounds now, people. <laughs> Craig, Craig looks like he's going to like just walk out. And I do apologize about that, Craig, but I got buttons, man. Buttons, dude. Buttons. Um, 
Oh, wait, did I miss that? I think I missed, I missed the news article. Whoops. Okay. See, look at that. Now, <laughs> I missed the news article. Um, I did want to bring it up. <laughs> I, didn't want to bring it. I didn't do that. I didn't do that on purpose. Um, <laughs> I do like that sound. I mentioned in the news that there was handwriting on the wall that Chrome OS was becoming more touch friendly, and that was based off of Rob Weeks had a post on Google Plus that he posted to the Chromebooks community on G Plus. Um, he posted an article where he actually noticed inside of the, and, and I might be missing this. This might have already come out before. But if you take a look at it, he's got images in there about how you can now handwrite inside of Chrome OS on the. If you have a touch display, it talks about just like if you have a, um, if you've ever used the handwriting recognition in Chrome on your uh, mobile device, um, he mentions that you can now write out your search criteria so that you can just instead of typing it on the the, the touch keyboard. Craig, have you seen that before? No, I believe this is exclusive to the Canary channel, so it's not even on the developer channel yet. Um, but it, it's interesting. I don't know that I'll use it that much, but I would love to play with it and see how well it works. Yeah, I'm excited about it because I, I like the one on Chrome. It was pretty cool on the when you go to search or whatever. I don't, James, did you ever try that on your mobile device? I tried to get it to work on um, Hello Sign and Hello Fax. Yeah, you're supposed to be able to like sign and and uh, and it didn't really work very well. I don't know if that was my phone or what, but that's really the only experience I've had trying to write something on a screen. Like Craig, I probably won't use this if it's on a laptop. Um, I I don't know. I'm trying to think of what would be easier and more efficient: writing it out or just pushing the button, the letter buttons on a keyboard. Um, I guess it would be kind of nice to write it out because then you wouldn't have the keyboard taking up half your screen, which can be kind of annoying sometimes when I'm typing stuff. I don't know if I had a typo because my keyboard is covering the input where the words are going, so I have to close the keyboard, see that I do have a typo, bring the keyboard back up, and whatever. So maybe sometimes this would be helpful, but I haven't really tried very many handwriting apps. I'm with you. So it does take up half the screen, though. Because what they've done is they've given you the keyboard kind of scrapes away from the middle, goes out to the very outer edges, and you just have this white area that you would then um, you write your letter in, uh, multiple letters or not, and then up at the top it kind of shows you what you're writing. Kind of Can they at the least way. make that like 50% opaque or something? <laughs> yeah. so you can see what's going on in the background. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you know what? I would put that in as a feature request <laughs> because that might that would be a good idea. Being able to move that around wherever you want. Um, if you like it over a, a small area, that way when you tap a text field, um, instead of opening the entire uh, keyboard, you might get a small, you know, 25% of the screen lower right-hand corner, but it's completely opaque, and you just write as best you can and see if you can fill it out. Well, that might be a better idea than having the huge area. I'm not sure. So, sorry I missed that, guys. That That's in the news area. Um, but that's pretty cool. Again, thanks to Rob Weeks for posting that to the... Um, the G Plus Chromebooks community, now at like 50 bajillion strong. How many are we at, Craig? 24,000 plus? 25,000 plus. Holy macaroni. That's pretty cool. So yeah, everyone, if, you, if you're not familiar with the G Plus community for Chromebooks, uh, there's a couple different Chrome OS, Chrome uh, communities out there, but Chromebooks um, definitely has everything you would be looking for for Chrome OS um, and Chromebooks. So definitely check that out. Thanks to Rob Weeks again. Um, now it's on to the main. Okay, so now we can get on to the main. Um, so the, the main this week is ARM versus x86. Now, of course, I'm going to go into my little diatribe as best I can to describe the difference between the two chipsets um, and the two architectures, as best well known. Um, so we, we, we talked about on the show the fact that ARM is not as powerful. Let's, let's bring that up first. Let's put the elephant in the room. Now let's bring the other elephant in the room, the fact that Intel and the x86 chip that we see in all of our Chromebooks uh, is draining the battery most of the time. But then we've seen the Haswell chip not drain the battery as much. And then the Baychall chip's coming out, and it, doesn't dry, it still doesn't drain as much. So now there's going to be this, now there's going to be this, um, you know, this fight against who's draining the most power yet giving the most optimization and the most, um, you know, the most power towards you know performance 
in regard to your applications. So this this kind of conversation comes up a lot. James earlier actually said, you know, they joke about ARM um, performance. Um, and so we have these debates constantly about ARM versus the x86. And I say x86 because Intel is definitely one of the pioneers, but AMD has also brought some stuff to the table. They also manufacture x86 chips, and then also so do, and then Intel manufactures x86 chips. They're also the ones that pioneer technologies inside of the architecture, um, whereas ARM is different in the fact that we call it ARM, um, but when we say ARM, we're actually talking about a company uh, that that actually works on the development of the, the the architecture itself, right? And they they've gone by a couple different names over in the past: Advanced Risk Machines, Advanced Risk Machines Limited, and now ARM's whole ARM Holdings. And what they do is they license the architecture itself out to manuf chipset manufacturers. So, like we talked about earlier, MediaTek. Um, Companies like that, Samsung also builds some. So, you know, there's and there's many, 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 many different companies. ARM chips are in a lot of things, especially mobile, because of the fact that it's fanless, very low power consumption. I mean, like very low in comparison. Is their performance not as good as an Intel chip? Of course, it's it's, it's not as good. Um, but that's actually because it's part of its design. It's not meant to do that. The ARM chip is is basically there's a couple different couple different names that they use they throw out there the reduced instruction set computing is an arm chip or risk um, is, the, is the acronym there um, but think smaller simpler instruction sets so that way you have it calling out one thing and that's what goes to the, the processor it then runs that again at a very low wattage because it can it just runs that one thing and it's done right so it just it's this process that has a really fast flow through and it doesn't use a lot of energy to do so whereas the x86 which is what we see in a lot of desktops and laptops, that has a complex uh, instruction set computing, which is CISC, uh, KISC. I'm not sure how to say that one, but um, think bigger, complex instructions. So you have, instead of that instruction set being very small, it's now like a bundle of, of instruction sets inside of this one instruction set, so to speak. And then, But you need now the hardware to be able to handle that. So there could be extra hardware you know, it just could be, get bigger, and then, of course, now you need more power to handle that. So as time progressed, they both kind of came out of the gate at the same time, but Intel was the one that everyone was watching because it was in the computers, and computers were coming bigger and bigger and bigger. They were coming every day of our lives. We, we would say, you know, I'm, I'm getting a new computer, and I'm getting this new Intel chip, the new P3, P4. I can remember talking about the, the 386, the 486, you know, the, the Pentium. The, the DX, the MX, I can remember, just that's all we talked about. But the ARM chip was always back there. You know, the ARM chip was always this, this low-powered, um, great little chip that, that still progressed just as much as Intel did, but it did it at a pace where it was keeping power consumption low, keeping the reduced instruction set computing type of mentality, but constantly still innovating and keeping going and, and, and going and going and going to where now then when things like the iPhone came out, well, they're not going to throw an Intel chip in there. It would drain the battery within five minutes, and it would, you know, the phone would be so high you could barely hold it. So they had to go with the ARM architecture, which if you own an iPhone or now you own an Android or any other device that's, that's small, fanless, and has a really good CPU in it, it's got an ARM chip in it. They actually have to sell more ARM chips than they do Intel chips or x86 chips because of the fact that the embedded chipset is in literally everything. So when you ask yourself... Do I want an ARM chip or do I want an Intel chip? The, the, the question really comes down to, you know, I think with Chromebooks it comes down to if you like the device. I know that, Craig, I wanted to, to go to you first. Now, we've, I did my best to, to, describe, um, to describe ARM versus x86. It's, it's very generic. I, I couldn't get much deeper than that because, honestly, I don't think all of us want to know how deep that goes. Um, the differences, you know, are, are vast, but yet it's still... Uh, a processor and an architecture that, that works on, um, you know, the, the languages that flow through it and how they how they work. That's pretty much the baseline to it. When it comes to ARM chips, I, I've actually I'm gonna I'm gonna admit something, and I wish I could I wish it was uh, not true, but the um, I've never worked with an ARM chip Chromebook. I wish I had. I, I'd love to get my hands on one. 
But Craig, I know that you've got the HP 11, right, which is running the Exynos chip, right? What are your thoughts? What are your what are your th- what are your thoughts on the fact that you've you've got the C seven twenty P? You've had you've had multiple your hands on multiple devices and, and also your Chrome box. What what about the ARM chip? Do you see as like the selling point for you? That's a great question, John. Um, before I answer that, I do want to point out one other big thing, which I know we're going to hit on, uh, which is the Octane scores which are a performance metric when you're comparing chips. Um, when it, one big difference between Intel and ARM when it comes to performance testing that you have to keep in mind is that uh, because Intel designs the chips and produces the chips, uh, two Intel chips um, are always going to have specific sets of performance, whether they're going into a Windows box, a Chrome OS machine, or a Mac OS device. If you put, a, if you put the exact same Haswell chip in a Chromebook and a Windows machine, you can expect the same, uh, typically the same performance and typically about the same battery life. Um, where, when it comes to ARM, however, because ARM just designs them and then uh, has various companies produce them, a chip produced by Samsung and a chip produced by another company may have wildly different performance and wildly different power consumption. So it's difficult to say kind of um, ARM versus ARM because there is no standard baseline for ARM. The designs are kind of standard, but they are just designs. Samsung takes them, they tweak them, they do their own stuff to them. You, they end up going into iPhones, they go into Samsung Series 3 Chromebooks, they go all over the place. And Samsung has had their hands in there and got them a little bit tweaked. And, so you just can't expect a baseline for ARM chips the way you can for Intel or AMD chips. And I think that's going to come up, so I just wanted to throw that out there too. Um, As for the selling point of ARM on Chrome OS, I truly think it boils down to the fanless design, and um, I wouldn't even say the power consumption right now, but I'll tell you what, I think the breaking point for ARM ARM chips is going to be when the USB 3.1 spec becomes finalized and goes into these devices, and we see more Chromebooks that can charge via micro USB. I think that's going to be the selling point. Um, when you can carry one charger out the door with you that will work on your Chromebook and your Android phone, that's a selling point. It really is. And as of now, Intel devices are not able to do that. They're just because they use so much power, they would drain more power than the charger could provide at any given time. Um, the Bay Trail chips will have to wait and see, but the Haswells are definite. That's not going to work. Um, so for me, the ARM chip is truly kind of a winner because of that. And I know it seems really odd and specific, but truthfully, it's a convenience factor that cannot be overlooked. Um, the fanless design, I prefer. I, I don't really. I don't really. I, I don't really prefer it. I don't have an opinion on the fanless design because fans don't bother me. Uh, but I know for a lot of people that is a selling point, point. Um, and it's one less thing that can break. I mean, it is. So I, I think the micro USB charging really for me is the selling point for ARM chips today. Um, and I would love to see more of that. And honestly, if Baytrail can do it, I would love to see Baytrail do it too. But uh, until then, I am just, my HP 11, that is my favorite feature of the HP 11. It really is. It's just, I carry one charger out the door with me and I'm set for the day. And I love it. There you go. Um... The charging thing is 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 a, is, a, is actually an incredibly valid point because, like you said, and, and we talked about the EU the other week, but the fact that they're they were going towards nothing but micro USB charging, you know, for all their all their you know uh, handsets sold in, that, in in the EU, they want to make sure that they lower the packaging cost, you know, the, the amount of waste coming out of the mobile market and all the different retired proprietary connectors. So it, it could become like really the norm to have that one connector, and you really you're right, it could be the one that, that you know. That solves them all. So there, there is that aspect. There's also the aspect of the fact that I think that we've seen it. We've seen I've I've not, but we've seen ARM in the Chromebook. We've seen um, James. I think you might have actually just recently said it's impressive what ARM can do on a Chromebook, or what you know how, how well Chrome OS does run on a, on, a, on, a, on an ARM chip, right? So to to it, it puts the competition in there. 
Intel's having to now come back with the Bay Trail. We don't know what it's going to do, how well it's going to work out. Um, like Craig, like you said, you don't want us to be able to charge and also be able to work at the same time. Uh, so it's it's funny to see Intel, who was in, you know, it was weird to see, if you look at the charts, you see like ARM going a certain way, and it's got this nice little line where it's doing power consumption, it's getting better with performance. It's this nice leveling, you know, raising slowly. When Intel back in the 90s, right, was just like skyrocketing up with, with power. All they wanted was power. All they wanted was speed. <laughs> and you could, you could be pumping watts and watts into this thing to get as much power as you needed out of it. So that's what they were kind of working on at the same time. So now Intel's having to kind of backtrack and come out with that that technology where they can run at a lower end, even though they're using the architecture really that needs power. So they're having to kind of bring it down there. So James, I know that you've also had some some ARM units, um, but are are you impressed? I'll ask you that. So are you impressed with the fact that ARM has been able to, knowing now what you know it means ARM versus Intel or ARM versus x86? you know that ARM really is going to struggle when it comes to performance. Not on purpose, but just because of the fact that what Craig said, you've got different manufacturers coming out with different, art, you know, how the architecture is put together, um, and then, you know, the Chrome OS team has to make sure that everything works properly. So are you, are you impressed, or are you kind of like, well, you know what, really just give me the intel? Well, I've never owned an ARM Chromebook myself, um, but I have... I have uh, played with them, and, and of course, I've read, you know, countless reviews and things like that. I am impressed, not so much with ARM, but more with what Chrome OS can do with an ARM chip. It's almost, I almost feel like putting an ARM chip in a laptop is like, almost like giving the laptop a disability, and then watching Chrome OS overcome that disability is kind of impressive. Um, it, it almost, ARM... It seems like a perfect match for Chrome OS because the ideologies are pretty much the same. We're talking about low power consumption, um, light, um, you know, light OS, it, and I think they're kind of getting closer. Chrome OS is getting, you know, a little more and more efficient. Arm Arm is able to be a little bit more powerful, and I think soon it's going to get to the point where Chrome OS actually works pretty well on Arm chip. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet. So I personally would not be shopping for an ARM Chromebook, um, especially when, you know, one of the biggest selling points of ARM is supposed to be the battery. Well, my Haswell Chromebooks get eight hours of battery life. What does an HP 11 or a Samsung Series 3 get? Something less than eight hours. Um, like Craig mentioned, fanless design is another thing. Not I also don't really care so much about fanless design. Every time I turn my Xbox on, I, my hair is blown back by the fan on that thing. It's like, so a really, a little tiny fan on my Chromebook, not really a big deal. Um, but uh, the, one, the one thing that I would be, and maybe you guys can elaborate on this a little bit. Um, I, first of all, like Craig, I'm very excited about Bay Trail because it's still Intel. It's, it's x86, uh, but it's supposed to be, it is fanless, and it's um, going to be a little better on the battery. So that's exciting to see. The the one thing that concerns me about ARM is with with the architectures being different. I mean, we're not just talking about one processor that's faster and one processor that's slower. They're actually completely different architectures. That causes some problems once in a while. Uh, when Chromebooks, when the Samsung Series 3 was first released, Netflix didn't work on it, and it was because of the ARM architecture. Um, the Google Music Lab that allows you to upload music from your Chromebook doesn't work on ARM Chromebooks right now. Um, so one of my concerns while watching the, this sort of battle between the two chips is, is that always going to be a problem? It, it, is there always going to be things that don't work on ARM devices for a while and we have to wait for somebody to who feels like making it work to make it work? Or are we going to get to a point where we don't run into that kind of compatibility issue anymore. If that happens, it'll be really interesting to, to watch this uh, this battle. It'll be nice to see ARM get more powerful uh, because they're competing with Intel's power. It'll be nice to see Intel become more power efficient competing with ARM, and maybe someday they'll pretty much be the same. We'll just They'll both make great, powerful chips that are, that are good on the battery, and uh, then it'll, we'll just be... Uh, you know, competing on price at that point. And, I, and I'm, I'm with you. I, I think 
I'm going to go on that route, right? So, again, I've never seen an ARM chip, except for my phone, which actually I wanted to show you something in regard to the phone. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring up, I have um, Chrome, right, for, for mobile, for Android, right? You can see my Octane score, which I'm going to have a link to Octane if you want to test your Chrome device to find out what your Octane score is. You can see it's 3,028 was my Octane score for the current stable Chrome browser on Android. Then if I head over to, and you can see I'm doing this, you can see I'm at, then this is Chrome Beta, um, 3,268, right? So not a huge jump, but this jump is actually due to the fact that I'm using Chrome Beta. So my, my thought, and, and this is kind of what... Um, one of the parts, the parts of this episode that I wanted to have this episode for was because I think I definitely have like an in, an Intel, and I wouldn't say Intel because I've actually purchased uh, AMD chips mostly whenever I had to purchase just the chip. Um, I've, when it comes to x86, I have this mentality in my head that like it's better. And is it better performance-wise? Yes. But I'm giving up something. I'm giving up, you know, sometimes, you know, power consumption, other things, right, where... And James, I understand your, your concern where when it comes to the native apps, some of the native apps or the you know, some of the native calls to the OS, they need to be reconfigured for ARM um, because it is a different architecture. It's written differently. So you have to you can't use the same if you use the exact same code, it's not going to work. You have to actually recompile for this architecture. Um, but my concern is is that I don't want to get into an Intel x86 mindset. I really don't want that. And I actually it's you know, one of the reasons, the things that brought this up was because I saw, and I'm, what I'm showing on the screen now is uh, Samsung Exynos. They have this they have this logo, which looks like the snowflake from Frozen, right? And I was like, I saw this, and I was like, in my first thought in my head, because I think I'm a funny man, was Samsung, as your own marketing implies, you should let it go, reference to Frozen, um, when it comes to ARM chips, right? So I said this. Out loud, when I saw when I saw the uh, when I saw the article, I read the article, and, and the article actually is Samsung making a jump, putting an LTE radio inside of their their architecture for the Exynos. So I mean, like they're literally building everything into one chip that you can pop into anything, and then you have this LTE Wi-Fi. You have all the different chips that you need, all different antennas, and you're good to go. So it's like it, it's really pretty darn cool. Um, so I saw that though when I made that comment in my head. Which, which then later on I'm like, wait, wait a minute. You know, I, I say to myself, what was funny about that really was that the fact that it, the joke was absurd because of the fact that when it comes to mobile chipsets, ARM is the king. When it comes to energy consumption to power ratio, uh, ARM is king. And when it comes to embedded systems, ARM has no match. Um, it's the market leader when it comes to, you know, right now in, in terms of sales. So to say, to, to, to throw it out and say, no, no, these x86 architectures are better. I'm not quite sure. I, I think I, what I want to be is I want to be excited about ARM because it is that competitor that the x86 market can't just come in and just just bash around and, and, and be done with it. It's it's definitely going to come up because you know Google with the Chrome on the on the browser as they come up as iterations grow. If you look at the benchmarks, so let's talk about some benchmarks. I'm going to break it down. Break it down, right? So benchmarks, yeah, the ARM chips are, are not as good, right? You're looking at six thousand compared to nine thousand or eight thousand on the on the same type of model, like type of model. Now again, you can't really base everything as one, right? But when you look at octane score, you know that the lower is worse. So we're just going to go with that for now. Um, but if you look at what I did was is I, I went to the the Google Chromebooks. G plus community. I searched benchmark, and then I looked at all the different benchmarks. I just scrolled down, looked at all the images, and kind of cataloged in my brain what were the benchmark scores. And a couple people <clears throat> had done a benchmark a few months ago, and then now did a benchmark. And because now they're on you know version they were on version 33, now they're on version 35, it got better on an ARM chip, or even on an Intel chip, or x86 chip. So, Craig, my, my question to you is that, you know, you, you see the fact that, you know, you get, you get some perks with the ARM chip. You're going to get that 
um, you know, that one universal charger um, or something or something in that vein. But what about the fact that could ARM should people be concerned about buying an ARM laptop or an ARM Chromebook, right? Because aren't we? Aren't isn't everyone fighting for the same goal? Is is James correct where everything might just come together and be the same price, and you're just getting like the same type of uh, computer, whether or not you have an ARM chip or you have an x86 chip in? I think that's a noble goal, but I think if if that was going to happen, that would have already happened with Intel and AMD, and it hasn't. They both still kind of target different market segments. Intel reaches mainstream and AMD is more for performance computing. Uh, servers, gaming devices, things like that, that need extra power. Um, I mean, if we look at the processor kind of landscape of, at the moment, you've got ARM on the low end, Intel in the mainstream middle, and uh, AMD on the high end. They produce a lot of the uh, really, really graphic intensive, and uh, they produce chips for machines that need the extra power. Um, and I think if if the market was truly going to become um, kind of uh, brand blind, where every every chip performs the same, it's the same price, it doesn't matter who makes it, um, it would have already happened. Computing is not new. We're not in a we're not in a new era here. This is a it's had some time to mature. I think. I mean, do you do the, either of you two remember Power PC? I sounds familiar. <laughs> okay. Well, look it up. It was a separate architecture designed by Apple, IBM, and I want to say Motorola. Um, but anyway, it eventually fell um, just because it was different and there was compatibility issues and things like that. But um, I think we're not in a new position. And, and like John says, ARM is not necessarily the underdog today because they are a market leader in embedded systems and. I mean, they truly do have a market power, even if it's not necessarily a market power um, in, in the sense that it becomes an, a household name. You also don't see ARM commercials with that fancy little um, Intel inside type, um, you know, commercial. So um, I don't necessarily know that we need to give ARM any charity here. I, I think they really do stand on their own as a competitor to Intel. Um, so I, I don't think we need to baby them or anything like that especially because the most telling thing here is that ARM was so powerful on Chromebooks uh, in terms of uh, the Samsung Series 3 sold so well that Intel subsidized the cost of the Haswell chips to get products like the Acer C720 out the door at $199. We're not going to see that anymore because Intel is no longer going to subsidize the chips. Um, but they had to because they felt threatened by ARM. And the theory that ARM could dominate the Chromebook market with Intel being essentially boxed out because of pricing. So, and of course that relates directly back to the whole Microsoft conversation we were having earlier about how you can't miss opportunities like that. You have to kind of react uh, while you have time to react. So I think Intel probably made a smart move there. I don't necessarily appreciate that they subsidized the chips and now they're just going to stop. But um, I can see why they did it as a business maneuver. And I think it, it'll probably pay off long term, especially if they can sneak the Bay Trail in and they can kind of make the jump from um, buying a 199 Intel Chromebook to buying a 199 Intel Chromebook uh, with the average consumer not recognizing that there's a difference between Haswell and Bay Trail. Either way, it's an Intel Chromebook because Intel Chromebooks are performance-wise superior to the ARM Chromebooks like John has it in his mind. Um, which isn't necessarily True. the case. We haven't seen the Bay Trail performance yet, James. We haven't. Um, and I honestly, it'll be comparable to ARM, is what I assume. And if it is comparable to ARM, then James was right. We've reached the point where you can buy a 199 Bay Trail or a 199 ARM. They perform exactly the same, and who cares what's in it? But um, I think John's kind of right that there's that little bit of marketing that kind of sinks in your head and you think, oh, it's Intel, or oh, it's x86. It must be superior, even if the chip was specifically designed not to perform like a typical x86 or Intel chip might. Um, low power, um, or low performance, low power, good battery life. So I think, I think it boils down to marketing, mostly. That's my opinion. No, and I, I agree. I think it has to do with the fact that we talk about the 
about a sub two hundred dollar laptop would be kind of weird, and you're like, ugh. Um, the ARM chip is one of those things where everyone's heard of Intel, especially when it comes to personal computing. Everyone, you say things like, and James, you've been in this position where you're talking about Chrome OS, where you're you're literally talking Greek to someone that speaks English because you're like, Chrome OS is what you need if you you know, but oh, but you don't need these two or three things. With ARM, you're saying kind of the same thing. You're saying, oh, I know you want a personal computing device. I know you want a, a laptop. Um, but no, this one doesn't go boom, boom, boom. You know, it doesn't have that logo, and it doesn't. And it might not go as fast. Of course, you wouldn't say that as a salesperson. But you, when that person gets home, they go, why the hell would I want an ARM chip when I've got these subsidized Haswells or I've got these, you know, Celerons that might give me five hours, but they have better performance. Um, James, what are your thoughts on that? From a marketing perspective, where is ARM, and where can where can Chrome OS take it, or is it, or is are we just going to wait until the Bay Trails, and the and as to Craig's point, the properly configured ARM chips, um, and ARM chipsets that combine as one whole, um, you know, make it good as good as the Bay Trail sitting on you know. An Intel chipboard with the the Intel HD graphics and the you know all that good stuff. I think I think Chrome OS is is the best thing that's had. Well, I won't say that Chrome OS is great for ARM um, because it's allowed ARM to break away from just being just being the smartphone processor. So going from selling bazillions of ARM processors to smartphones, now they can actually start breaking out into people's uh, living rooms and uh, and because you know Windows wasn't going to do it. I mean, put Windows on an ARM chip, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> it's going to have to be a very watered down version of RT even to get it to work right on ARM chip. But uh, so um, it's, I think it's yeah. I was I gonna think, say. Uh, yeah, just to quickly correct you, um, mm -hmm. RT was designed for ARM. For oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that I was like that's why you can't install apps on it because none of the apps built for Windows are built for ARM. Right. So. Gotcha. <laughs> right. So obviously Windows didn't bring ARM to the laptop world correctly. Um, they tried, <laughs> uh, but Chrome OS is actually doing it um, successfully. The Samsung Series Three being the top-selling laptop on Amazon for over a year, like the number one freaking Amazon laptop for over a year, was an ARM powered laptop. So I bash ARM all the time because it's fun to bash things, but number one on Amazon for over a year says something. I don't think there was any Windows RT laptops in the top 10 for over a year, um, but this Chrome OS that people made fun of and no one's ever heard of was the number one selling laptop for over a year, and they've even improved on that chip. The Samsung Series 2 has an, an, an ARM chip, but it's an improved version of the chip that's in the Samsung 3 and the and HP 11. So um, I think I think ARM is is probably just loving Chrome OS right now. Um, Chrome OS is very lightweight, like Craig said, built specifically for lower end chips. Um, I mean, I was just shopping for a Windows machine today, looking for probably Yoga, and <clears throat> I forgot how to shop for computers because being in Chrome OS it almost doesn't matter. It's like, what, two gigs of RAM? Oh, that's fine. You know, Haswell? What is what is a Haswell? I don't even know. It's like less than an i3, which in the PC world is a crappy processor, right? So I'm shopping for these computers, and I don't even know what to look for. I'm like, i3, 5, 7. I assume 7 is the best. 8 gigs of RAM, do I need that on a Windows machine? I don't even know anymore. But, like, <laughs> probably, right? So ARM chips, they're just, like, right there. They're so close to just being, to, to us not complaining about them anymore. You know, HP 11, Samsung Series 3, they only lag a little bit. They're not, like, terrible, like, oh, I can't even use this machine, you know, like the BlackBerry Storm or any Windows machine I've ever used. It's it's They're really good machines. They're just not quite as fast as a Haswell. So I think we're really close to, um, to this kind of debate not even happening anymore. It's like it, Chrome OS getting a little bit better, like you said, um, ARM getting a little bit better, it's not going to matter pretty soon. We're going to stop complaining about ARM and we're going to start complaining about other things like fans and USB chargers. 
it, it, and that's a good point. We we have to get away from, and that, that's where I was with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, you know, getting away from my mentality. I have this Intel mentality with my with my PCs, with my laptops. Now, really quickly, because we're running out of time, but I'm going to show you up on the screen. I'm going to put this up there, and I'll, I'll put the link online. This is Age of Ascent on my phone. Now this is a screen screen grab there, a screenshot, right? And you can see it. It worked really, really, really well. Um, was it was it perfect? No, because I was also on the the 4G network and things like that. There it is in landscape. Or this is portrait of in landscape earlier. But I took a screenshot because I I was like, holy cow, um, Craig, you've actually you know that they've also optimized for ARM as well. Because um, on your HP 11, it was blazing fast. So you have somewhere where. This is my final punch. This is my final thought on this. In the end of my article that I wrote, or whatever you want to call it, post, uh, um, I'm not an article writer, uh, my last comment is, I'm an idiot. And, and that's not to say, what it is I'm ignorant? I'm ignorant to the fact that ARM has a lot of power. And when even though the Age of Ascent team... You know, they, they went after the, the, the graphics chip. They hit the GPU. They really did. They, they really built from the ground up in a web-centric world. They built their app, and then they actually said, you know what, let's, let's go ahead and not only be powerful on Intel, but let's make sure that on the ARM chip, we're going to go ahead and make sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're optimized for that as well. And literally, the next week that, that I heard from, from, from – uh, from James and Ben, they were like, "Yeah, that's going to be in the um, in the next update when you guys play on the, the pre-flight test." Holy cow! I hear that Craig gets on there and it's like blazing fast in comparison because weeks prior he had trouble. So, is it possible in this web-centric world that with this web-centric OS, where apps are built using web technologies, where you can make things optimized for the for, for the two different chipsets, and it still be just there was no difference in Age of Ascent for me. When I got online, it still immediately became a cockpit and immediately worked. And it worked the same way for Craig, even though he was on the ARM chip. Just the next week, they optimized, and boom, it worked better. So with Chrome OS, we're in a web-centric world. We talked about native client last week, and even that has been optimized so that way when they, when they build their apps, it still runs on ARM versus not ARM because they, they came up with not just... The nasal, the, the pinnacle, right? So, or the knackle and the pinnacle. I can't remember <laughs> the different words, but so those are my final thoughts on that. Is that ARM is is I think here to stay. It's a great competitor, and things are only going to get better for it. If you think that you know you're concerned, I think if you're if you're the type of person that wants to be mobile all the time, I think it's the chip to go with. Like Craig said, with the with the with the power consumption and with the um, with the HP 11 having that charger that's just like your phone, amazing. So. I'm going to kind of leave on that note in the main, um, but really quickly, really quickly, there were two apps that I did want to talk about um, just because they've been brought up to me um, by people in the community as, as really great apps, and I went ahead and got them. Um, James, you actually posted about an RSS aggregator that you found, an extension out there. I don't know if I grabbed yours or I just found another awesome one, um, but I grabbed the RSS aggregator out of the web, web store. And I like it. It doesn't sync, which kind of sucks. I'm going to say that out loud. That sucks that it doesn't sync between my Chrome devices. But it's really nice, and it has a really good interface. It's really fast. It's crisp. RSS aggregator, really good. What was was the what yours, Craig? Uh, James, was that the one that you used? Um, honestly, I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> I know, because you you try the different apps, and you're like, is this one good? Is this one good? For me. You know, I, I like this one as an aggregator for local. It's got a great, the extension works really fast, really well. Um, the other one is on my screen now, which is Google Docs Quick Create. Um, and this is after I had um, put out there a post about how to easily search Google Docs from your Omnibar. Um, someone came up to me, and I, of course I can't remember who it was. It's someone I see all, every day too on, on G+. But he said, listen, Google Docs Quick Create, is, is one of the ways he wanted to make turn the Omnibar into the command line and be able to just immediately create a, 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 a GDoc or a G Sheet or whatever, you know what I mean? So he wanted to be able to immediately create those. This extension actually does that. If you look at my screen, I'm going to go ahead and share it real quick. If you look at my screen, 
uh, if you're watching, it's an extension. It's up at the top, so it's not an app. It's an extension. You click it, and then it gives you the options, and then all you have to do is hit New Document. Bob's your uncle. You're running a new document. So you didn't have to go into GDocs or, or click an icon on the desktop for, you know, uh, make a new doc. It was just right up there in the extension in the bar there to click that. Um, and then, again, here's the reader RSS feed. Of course, here it's blank because they don't sync. <laughs> so this RSS reader is blank. But it does take import-export of OPML, so that's, that's awesome. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, the other thing was really quickly before we go, is my, my plus ones are actually the people that responded to, I put a call out there, and we had a, f a number of people call, come out and say, basically, I, I came out and I said, listen, please give us feedback. You know, it kind of, it fuels the show. Practical Chrome is, is, is built by people, me, James, and Craig, who met in the community and then Decided to be on a show. We don't, you know, we just we, we wanted to be able to share what we what we love, our passion. We have the show. It's just a really fun thing that we do every week. And um, I just want to put the call out there for any type of uh, of, of feedback that we could get. We got a, a few things. Curtis Vaughn, Matt Arnett, uh, Curtis Jones Jr. They they all responded. And they they talked about you know what they were looking for in the show. Um, Curtis put out there that he wanted to see more interviews with people that use Chromebooks every day, which I think is a great idea. Um, Matt talked about um, the fact that you know his device, since a kid can't get a, a Gmail account under the age of 13, it's it's really tough to manage that. Even supervised users, they don't have all the functionality that you, you'd like them to have. They can't have certain things, so that becomes tough. And then also um, locking it down for the, the entire Wi-Fi, which I thought was a um, which is actually a really good thing for the kids. So we'll, we'll have to talk about that some other time. But the, the, he talked about that, and then of course um, Curtis Jones. Uh, he wanted to know where the where Google was with the marketing love for Chromebooks. <laughs> he's like, you know, and he makes the point. You see, Windows is like digging hard. They've got their six points this week. Um, they, they you know they want to sell these two fifty machines, and come Christmas they're going to be hitting it harder. Where is Google in the marketing department, Craig? You, you talk about how you're not on the, the marketing team, but you know if you were, he'd be selling the you know selling this stuff because it, it makes a lot of sense. You know what we, the things that we talk about on the show. Um, so those are, those are the things that I wanted to, to quickly mention. I just want to thank those people uh, for, for those, for those uh, suggestions and feedback. And, and if you want to send feedback to the show, definitely check out practicalchrome.com. There's a contact link at the top. Uh, you just hit email, and it's a little form. You can send us any information that you like, whether it be a, a, you know, a comment, a concern, uh, anything like that, a comment on an article. Um, of course, also G+, Practical Chrome and YouTube practical Chrome as well um, and on that note I you know we'll we'll kind of end it um, James throughout the week on the G pluses and on the interwebs out there and the Twitters the Facebooks maybe not the Facebooks and the Twitters let's stick with G plus <laughs> where can people find Mr. Wallace throughout the week and find out what he's doing and what he's talking about well you can find me on, on Google plus for sure at uh, James Welbus um, as far as I know, I'm the only James Welbus out there, so it shouldn't be too hard to find, um, at least on Google+. Plus, There's like 10 of us on Facebook. Um, and uh, you can find me in the Chromebooks community. Um, there's also the Chrome for Business community, um, which is a, kind of a new um, community. It's for um, Chromebooks and Chrome OS, but it's, it's more focused towards uh, business and enterprise type uh, use. So um, you'll find me there uh, as well recently. Awesome. And Mr. Tumbleson, where can people find? And I don't want to hear about how you know you've got some kind of GPS tracker on your on yourself or whatever. Where can, where where can people find Mr. Tumbleson's great work and portfolio out there of things he does? Listeners can find me on Google Plus. I use my real name, Craig Tumbleson, and you can also find me at ChromeUp.com. There you go. Awesome. So check that is what is biz and ChromeUp.com also. Two great sites that we want to check out. Um, of course, my name is John Elephant, and you know I love crazy sounds. And I like to make people laugh. <laughs> All that good stuff. Usually I make terrible jokes, but what can you do? Um, but we're here every week. At 1010 10, Tuesday nights, um, that might be changing up. I don't know. Well, we're going to figure all that out uh, as we go forward. Um, but definitely check us out at practicalchrome.com. Check us out again at the YouTube page. Uh, this is where you can come every week um, for a very 
informative, fun episode uh, of a show that, that's based around Chrome. And we hope that you come back next week. We hope that you either watch us live or check out the MP3. I'm going to try and get them out tonight. I'm going to try and hammer it home. I'm going to try. I'm gonna do, seriously. Seriously. I'm going to do my best where it's going to be like, when are we going to put it out? Tomorrow. Right, so I want to do my best to get to get everything out on the same day, and and, and do that. So that'd be, that'd be great. So that means that I'm going to basically be up for another couple of hours, but that's okay. Um, so definitely check us out, practicalchrome.com. My name, of course, is John Alton, and you can find me on practicalchrome.com, and on of course G Plus under my real name, John Alton. So again, everyone, thank you so much for watching, James, Craig. I hope you guys have a great rest of the evening and a great rest of the week. Uh, and, and I'll see you guys next week.